Let's talk about normal pressure hydrocephalus. The name pretty much tells you what it is. So hydrocephalus means that the ventricles are enlarged and normal pressure meaning that on the lumbar puncture there is a normal opening pressure. Now this is a form of communicating hydrocephalus, meaning that there's no CSF blockage. If there was a CSF blockage, that would be a non-communicating hydrocephalus. The disease is more common with older age, especially with folks that are over 80 years old. And even though it's not a very common disease, because it's potentially reversible, it is commonly tested. Uh, the cause is unknown. So for clinical features, the symptoms are chronic and develop over many months to years. A gait impairment is the main hallmark feature and is required for diagnosis. The gait impairment is not super specific, but you can see people taking small steps, having a slow walking speed, having a magnetic gait, meaning that they don't really lift their feet off the floor. and they can fall easily when turning. There can also be cognitive impairment that usually starts uh, a little bit after the gait impairment and that can consist of impaired concentration, executive function, and apathy. A urinary urgency or incontinence is typically a later feature and is not always present. Importantly, there can be no symptoms of increased uh, intracranial pressure, meaning the patient does not have headaches, vomiting, visual loss, or papilledema. For evaluation, a CT or MRI will see enlarged ventricles. Uh, specifically, the Evans ratio will be over 0.31, meaning that the distance between the frontal horns seen by the smaller arrow, is greater than 31% of the widest diameter of the cerebrum. So the frontal horn is the numerator and the widest diameter is the denominator. There will be a normal opening pressure on lumbar puncture, as the name implies, and also the CSF fluid will be normal in terms of cell count and differential. If there is dementia present already, then reversible dementia workup is also sent at that time, and it's typically uh, it's going to be normal. For treatment, a ventricular shunt will benefit roughly 70% of patients, and that can be a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or ventriculoatrial shunt. There are a few different types of shunts that can be placed, but uh, patient selection is important. So to select for patients, you can perform a high volume lumbar puncture draining greater than 30 cc's and you'll do a gait evaluation before and after that lumbar puncture and if there's improvement that the patient will probably benefit from a ventricular shunt. Even if there is no improvement, a percentage of those patients will still benefit from the shunt. Uh, a different way to do this would be to do a lumbar drain trial where uh, a lumbar drain is placed for a week as an inpatient and if the patient's symptoms improve then that can also identify someone who will benefit from a shunt. Uh, one important complication and uh, the, one of the more common complications of a shunt is over drainage and when that happens you can have neurologic deterioration from a subdural hematoma because you're breaking the bridging veins due to how quickly the brain is shrinking. So for prognosis, patients with a shorter duration of symptoms, less than six months, will typically benefit more. And if they've had the symptoms for longer and if they've been progressing to moderate or severe dementia, then those patients are typically unlikely to improve after shunting.